We'd managed to stay undetected in West Papua for two weeks when we finally received a call we'd been waiting for. We were told to spend the night in a safe house before driving out at four in the morning. We were off to meet West Papua's underground army. Our contacts told us where we're going is so remote there were no roads. We're travelling with three men wanted by police for their membership of the outlawed Free Papua Movement, the OPM. Just being in their company could get us arrested. We had to fly deep into the highlands past the mountain ridge which runs alongside the controversial Freeport mine. We landed at a remote airstrip on a hilltop two and a half hours from Jayapura. The nearest Indonesian soldiers are 10 kilometres away, which means that they, uh, if they hear we're here, they could get to us, I guess. Indonesian troops weren't our only worry. We were miles from anywhere and walking deeper into the highlands. And in the past, the OPM has taken Westerners and journalists hostage. The village was hidden away. As we entered, we noticed there were few men about, hardly on first sight a rebel stronghold. We were taken to meet the women of the village. You'll notice they've got the black soot on their faces as a sign of mourning and sadness. They told us three of their husbands had been killed just three months before in a clash with Indonesian troops. Yanata told me she'd only been married one week when her husband was shot dead. Another of the widows was grieving but defiant. She said, well, we never asked the Indonesians to come here and set up an army post in our village. They're the ones who caused the trouble in the first place. So my husband wanted to go and get their weapon and to try and attack them. And he did the right thing. I listened to an outpouring of loss and anger. She said, Indonesian soldiers can go to hell. We don't want them here. We don't want Indonesia here. They kill our husbands. They kill our people. We don't want anything to do with Indonesia. After a few hours, men started drifting into the village. It turned out they were local commanders of the OPM, an advance guard for the movement's leader, Kelly Kualik. Yep. Kelly Kualik is wanted by the Indonesian government for treason, kidnapping and murder, a separatist who's one of the most wanted men in the entire country. The Indonesians say they bring development, they bring uh, economy, they bring many things to the Papuan people. Yeah. Kualik told me West Papua is a country rich in natural resources and yet Papuans remain poor while the Indonesians benefit. All they do is steal our land, they create opportunities for Indonesians and all they want to do here is create business and take money for themselves. A few years ago, you took some foreign hostages. Why did you do that? Kualik told me they didn't take the hostages for money. It was simply to bring international attention to the fact that there is suffering in Papua at the hands of the Indonesian military, that people are dying. Even though we only have traditional weapons and the occasional ones they, they get from the soldiers, they, they fight because they believe what they're doing is right. And for them, it's almost a holy fight. It's a holy war for their own land. We were invited to stay the night. More and more OPM fighters emerged from the darkness. Some haven't seen each other in years. They told us they've been marching for a week to get here as a show of strength. It's quite interesting because they've got young guys with them that can't be much more than teenagers. And um, it's pelting out with rain as you can see, but they just seem to be quite happy to turn up. 
This was completely spontaneous. These amazing ancient songs. They said the words told of their enduring links with the land, of resistance, and of a desire for independence. But for all their ancient traditions, these people are acutely aware of modern political symbols. We woke at dawn to find the villagers preparing to raise the banned flag of free West Papua. It's an illegal act in Indonesia to do this. In fact, people have been shot for doing this, for raising this flag. And for these people, it may look like a small act of defiance, but in fact, it's a very brave thing for them to do. Indonesian soldiers are not very far away. The Indonesian government says there's absolutely no foundation whatsoever for claims of arrest, torture and killings in Papua. It says a recent autonomy law now gives a majority share of revenue raised from its natural resources back to the province. And it points out that the international community recognises that there was a vote that made Papua part of Indonesia in 1969. General Few journalists get into West Papua, fewer still evade arrest. And so the tensions here, the deaths and the protests on a remote island rarely make for dramatic headlines. What it feels like is a really slow suffocation of a people and a way of life. They just feel that uh, there's going to be more and more Indonesians and fewer and fewer Papuans. And they feel if they don't stand up against it, then uh, they're going to be wiped out.